ni ohi awei wa no hodu ai ohu ohu mu mu sawa ile no homa na ohu pa hi o ga ba li ku ga ba ha ba ba li ku ga ba ma ka ni ku ma ku ha ga li ta ohu le wa ia ka la wa ha ka anu o le ke ya ohu no ke no ke Hakala la ke ya manu ka ohu ka ohi ahama me ho ahama idale o kale wa pane apane mai pa hai ke ya mamu e ni ohi awei wa no hodu ai ohu ohu mu mu kawai ne no homa na ohu pa hi o ka baliku ka wa ha wa baliku ka pa ma ka ni ku ma ku ha ka li ta ohu le wa ia ka la wa ha ka anu o le ke ia ohu no ke no ke ha ka la la ke ia manu ka ohu ka ohi aha ma Mai ho o ha mau da le o ka le wa pa ne a pa ne mai pa hai ke ya ma mu e Thank you Lyle. Our first uh, uh speaker this morning uh is going to be uh, Michael Sulley. Uh, he is um a keynote speaker for the, this conference and Uh, he's the professor emeritus from of uh, environmental studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and uh, he's he was uh, founder of the Society for Conservation Biology, uh, one of the most important uh, conservation organizations uh, in the United States. Um, also, the Wildlands Project, and he's been president of both organizations. Uh, he's written and co-edited uh, nine books on biology, conservation biology. and social and policy con- uh, context of conservation he's pu- published more than 170 papers uh, on population and e- evolutionary biology fluctuating fluctuating uh, asymmetry population genetics uh, island biogeography and the list goes on um he's a fellow of both the american association for the regulation of in, uh, interactive species and sorry uh, the association of the advancement of science and uh, the american academy of arts and sciences he has received the guggenheim fellowship and uh, the sixth re- recipient of the archie car medal so i i would like to introduce to you michael sulley he's going to talk to you about island is, is island conservation fundamentally different from continental uh, conservation. So I leave the podium to Mike. Uh I'm trying to contextualize Hawaiian conservation and co- and compare it to the conservation challenges and visions and methods in other places. Uh 
one of those other places is North America, but North America has been on and off connected to South America and on and off connected to Asia and therefore to Africa. So there's really one big northern supercontinent and then there's Australia, which is a, t a relatively small isolated uh, island continent. And then the third case was uh, the Hawaiian Islands, a, an oceanic archipelago. And you know, we all know there's differences, but uh, I thought it'd be fun to revisit those differences and see what we could learn by taking another look. That's Australia. I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to download, because I don't have the skill at the last minute, uh, a good, a good uh, space shot of the Hawaiian Islands, but I'll show you something a little bit later that indicates uh, its situation in the world. So, uh, before I begin, I just want to say a couple of things, and I tend to get <clears throat> emotional, so please excuse me if I do, which I will. Uh, each year, uh, a group of dedicated conservationists assemble here in Hawaii to share their knowledge, their ideas, their visions, their hopes, their grief, and a few of you probably your microorganisms. <clears throat> the, the question is, why do you do this? Why do you come together like that? Why, in other words, why do you love nature? Why do you love bio biological diversity, which is a, a clinical term for nature? I much prefer creation, actually, to, uh, to biodiversity because creation is juicy. It, it resonates with people. It has connotations. And it doesn't have to refer to what fundamentalists call creation, but life was created. Darwin explained how. Sometimes we forget that we love creation. Sometimes we forget that's why we're here. Uh, that we are all brothers and sisters working together to protect something we think is most precious, the living jewels of this archipelago. So, Remember this the next time, if I may say so, you find yourself in conflict with other conservationists who also love Hawaiian nature, Hawaiian creation. And please remember that you all desire to accomplish the same thing. So that's the sermon. <laughs> so let's begin with looking at uh, these three systems, North America, Australia, and Hawaii, briefly, with regard to their condition prior to the arrival of human beings, which was in Australia about 50,000 years ago, in North America about 11,000 years ago, and Hawaii about 1,000 years ago. First, I'll just compare North America and Australia because they're similar in general features. Uh, North America, like Eurasia, had mega carnivores, great big carnivores. The American lion, which went extinct about 11,000 years ago, was bigger than the African lion. So, and there were saber-toothed tigers and uh, other ferocious critters. And big carnivores, not just mega carnivores, there were the ordinary big carnivores like wolves. And there were small carnivores and mini carnivores, and of course there were the mega herbivores and the big herbivores and the small herbivores. I'll show you a few pictures in a minute, and everything else. And Australia uh, had very few large carnivores. I'll show you one. Very few big carnivores. There was really only one that's uh, well known. <clears throat> and then the rest, but uh, they, were, they were fewer in number. And There's North America, with, uh, that had about three or four species of elephants, uh, most of them larger than the Indian elephant, as you can see in front. Australia's largest herbivore was pretty big, 2,700 kilograms, diprotodon, but, and it had other species that were almost as large, large kangaroos as well. <clears throat> Australia's largest carnivore was not a mammal, 
it was a large lizard, which scared that bird so much it dropped its eggs on the ground. <clears throat> it was like a Komodo dragon, but much bigger, 1,000 kilograms. The largest marsupial carnivore was the marsupial lion, coming in at about 110 kilograms, you know, a little bit bigger than a mountain lion or puma, maybe. That's about it. Not it, but there, there were others, but it wasn't nearly as diverse as North America. <clears throat> but it had a megafauna. That's the point. It had a megafauna, which also went extinct as soon as humans arrived. Hawaii uh, is a lot different. It didn't have giant reptiles or giant carnivores of any kind. It had some raptors, but they weren't any bigger than contemporary raptors here. Uh, there were no mega herbivores. There were no big herbivores. Uh, there were some s relatively small herbivores, or depending on your, what you consider small, uh, a lot of flightless ducks and geese and rails. Here are some of the Australians, uh, the Hawaiian species that you're familiar with, that some of which, a lot of, half of, half of the birds, as you saw, have already gone extinct, and many of the remaining are severely threatened. Here are some of these huge, relatively huge uh, geese and ducks that uh, once occupied the islands, which disappeared quickly. By the way, this, this painting is by Julian Hume. So what's next? Well, <clears throat> all this implies that there were major differences how, in how ecosystems functioned in these three places. In North America, the abundance of large, very large herbivores and the abundance of very large carnivores certainly suggests the parallel to um, contemporary Africa and to the top-down regulatory nature of those systems. That is, the amount of herbivory was tremendous, the amount of predation was tremendous, and uh, we've seen what happens when you remove the largest predators in the system in Yellowstone National Park, where entire ecosystems in the park disappeared. So you can imagine what happened to North America. Oh, it's morning again. <laughs> you can imagine what happened to North America when the megafauna disappeared. The plants are still all there, basically. Every single plant, and most of the invertebrates are still there. But the system was decapitated. The same thing happened in Australia. So again, there was probably a lot of top-down regulation of those systems too, uh, but now maybe less. Australia, uh, excuse me, Hawaii was a lot different. It's probably always been uh, a system that in which the abundance of things and the structure of ecosystems is determined pretty much by primary productivity. But primary productivity, NPP or GPP, whatever you want to call it, the amount of photosynthesis, was much greater in the past if our speculations are correct. And the reason is, as I'll mention in a minute, there were a lot more birds. Uh, in North America, the system was dominated by mammals. In Australia, it's more egalitarian in Australia. There were lots of mammals, but uh, they weren't as dominant as they are in the, in the rest of the world, the Northern Hemisphere. There were, there were an amazing number of large birds in Australia, <clears throat> flightless, flightless birds included. Uh, termites, at least in, in the northern part of Australia, seemed to dominate the landscape. And each termite mound, I was told when I was there a few weeks ago, in the Kimberley, and there are lots of termite mounds in the Kimberley, uh, about every 10 feet, and, and they're about the size of a rhinoceros, and each one consumes as much grass as a small antelope would in Africa. So if you can make that transformation in your head and look out at thousands of termite mounds and imagine thousands of ungulates out there, you can get a, a feeling for how much primary consumption is going on by insects, not by ungulates or, or mammals. And reptiles are also super abundant and diverse in Australia. So that's a different kind of a continent. Well, both of those, though, uh, are completely different from 
the Hawaiian Islands, in which uh, pelagic birds probably were the dominant force on these islands. Why? Well, they do what birds do. They poop <clears throat> when, they, when they breed here. And so there was a massive uh, supplement of fertilizer to these islands. So the vegetation must have looked a lot different than it does now, uh, lacking that a source of, of nutrients. Also, there were lots of terrestrial birds, lots of insects and snails. A great, great, beautiful radiation of snails. So plant competition was probably uh, strong in Hawaii because there weren't many herbivores except for the large ducks and geese wandering all over the place. But they didn't get up in the trees. There weren't a lot of defoliators, perhaps. We're not sure. It doesn't look like there were. So it looks like herbivory was limited and even though the plants lost most of their protection because of the absence of large herbivores, they still, um, they still were preyed on, but it's likely that there was more competition among plants uh, here than there ever was in North America or in Australia. So the question that occurs is this. <clears throat> the scale, isolation, and history of oceanic, I oceanic islands makes them categorically different from continents. How will these differences affect conservation plans and tactics in Hawaii? And more to the point, why should anything you learned elsewhere apply here? Is there anything more that we need to know except that this place is not anything like the biology, the ecology of these islands, not anything like those on continents. Doesn't that give us pause? Doesn't all of the training we got at Texas Tech or uh, Colorado State or Davis seem irrelevant here? If it doesn't, you probably need to think about it. The exotic species, of course, are were the major issue in the Hawaiian Islands and in almost all in probably all oceanic islands. In, in the United States, the major challenges are livestock introductions, exotic livestock and invasive fish, and also exotic, um, I'm just talking about vertebrates now, I won't go into invertebrates. In Australia, the, uh, the vertebrates that are a problem are exotic mammals, and I'll mention those in a minute, fish and the cane toad, of course, which is, which is getting everywhere in Australia, livestock course. One of the things livestock do is they reduce the cover. They graze the cover down, in, particularly in the arid areas where there's no trees or bushes, there's just grass and forbs. And when the cover is gone, not only is there a lot of erosion, but all the animals that need that cover to protect themselves from predators, especially the exotic predators, have nowhere to hide. Hide. So one of the most serious effects of livestock grazing, sheep and cattle grazing in Australia, is, uh, is the, has led to, the, is led to the extinction of many small, medium-sized marsupials who have no place to hide. Uh, in Hawaii, uh, you have your share of exotic mammals. And we saw the situation in Kauai where there's no place to hide, apparently, from them in, in Kauai. This is just a few pictures to remind you, to show you that I do care about your visual cookies. <laughs> These are from Australia. They have over a million camels running around in the so-called wild areas of Australia. Goats, rabbits, <clears throat> cane toads. And the most devastating of all, perhaps, are feral house cats and feral foxes that were released from fox breeding facilities there. And it's thought that most of the extinctions, 20 or so extinctions of small mammals in Australia is due to these critters. Uh, there's one way to fight them, and I'll be mentioning that in a minute. In the Hawaiian Islands, uh, there have been, in the last thousand years, introductions of four rodents that are serious problems. They're not only 
predators on animals, they're also seed predators and probably affect the reproduction of much of the vegetation. You know the mongoose, the Indian mongoose, which fortunately isn't on Kauai yet. So in the plant situation is also uh, serious. In the United States, there are about 20,000 species of plants. Uh, it's hard to get the exact number because um, of the confusion between different, different, different categories, like vascular plants and non-vascular plants. But, uh, and about 2,600 to 5,000 of these, of these species are naturalized, or, or exotics that are naturalized. So about 9 or 12 percent, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, if you know the real numbers, are naturalized. In Australia, it's a little higher than that. There's fewer species of plants, about 16,000, but uh, about 2,500 are naturalized. Uh, it's nothing to compare to Hawaii, though. Hawaii, compared to these other places, is a different world where there's only a thousand species of native plants and, and half the plants are a thousand, yes, no, yes, a thousand native and a thousand naturalized. So about 50% in Hawaii are naturalized. Uh, we, you know some of these, like, like buffalo grass and other exotic uh, fire conducting grasses. I think this is on the big island, uh, <clears throat> which tend to dominate communities. And worse than that, they're fire conductive. So, uh, after the second fire that goes through with molasses grass, <clears throat> you know, the native ohia forests are about gone. These are all dead trees. And uh, same thing is happening in, in North America, too, in the Great Basin, where, where cheat grass now dominates. We, we're having a similar phenomenon. Um, it, and uh, buffalo grass in the Sonoran Desert is doing the same thing to columnar cactus, basically eliminating them in large parts of the Sonoran Desert. All of these grasses, by the way, were, were introduced by um, government to provide forage for cattle originally, except cheatgrass. Cheatgrass is a genuine weed. Uh, as far as uh, exotic mammals go in Hawaii, you're familiar with pigs. You can read. It's, if you don't understand, I'll explain later. Uh, in invertebrates, in Australia, the problematic invertebrates are mollusks, crustaceans, parasites, and earthworms. In, did I say Australia? I meant the United States, North America, but particularly the, the United States. In Australia, ants are a seri very serious problem. In Hawaii, uh, you know, the, the 75 or so species of native snails are, have been essentially eliminated by apple snails and wolf snails. Uh, earthworms are problematic. Insect parasitoids are problematic, as are, are gall-forming wasps that have been introduced. And many things were introduced in soil. Uh, many, so it's, uh, everything's a problem in Hawaii. Pathogens, uh, in, in North America, the, the chestnut blight um, and uh, fungus diseases of many other tree species have decimated our forests on and off. Uh, the, um, the chestnut was the largest and most dominant and most important uh, tree in North America until it was eliminated, and our forests have never, never recovered. Those trees were used, uh, produced so much mast that, uh, that uh, nothing has been able to, to provide the food for wildlife that the chestnuts did. They also probably contributed to the extinction of the most abundant bird in the world at that time, the passenger pigeon. Uh, they were used for ship masts, for the construction of houses, for the construction of beautiful furniture, uh, fortunately, <clears throat> they, uh, the, some brave biologists have been cross, crossing them back, back crossing them uh, to um, some European chestnuts, which are resistant to the chestnut blight. And we're now planting out chestnuts again in North America, a, a conservation success story, we hope. 
In Australia, Phytophthora, uh, uh, or uh, what's that called? Dieback uh, fungus uh, is a serious problem all over, all over the continent. It's not sure whether it's exotic or not, uh, but most people think it is exotic forms of Phytophthora. They're also native forms. In the Hawaiian Islands, um, as you know, the, uh, most of the honey creepers are subject to infection by bird pox and bird malaria. I don't like to use the word avian. Avian is a bad word. It's a word that people use when they try to sound scientific, but what they mean is bird. <laughs> and we have a perfectly good word in English for bird. So we don't need to say avian diseases, we can say bird diseases. You know about that. There was this marvelous radiation of tree snails here and other, other kinds of land snails, which is gone uh, for reasons you know and I'm not going to go into. So the overall effect of invasive species has been considerable in North America although there's quite a bit of resistance to invasive species, particularly in, in intact, undisturbed habitats, particularly forested habitats. Australia doesn't have many forested habitats, so uh, the problem in Australia is significantly greater because of invasive species. But in the Hawaiian Islands, it's overwhelming. It's the overwhelming cause of in impoverishment, in part because the local species uh, have very little resistance uh, to uh, species from large continents uh, which are, have been bred over the millennia to be more competitive. So the question is, are agencies and conservation NGOs paying enough attention to invasive species threats? And I, I'm sure most of you will say, well, it depends which side you're on, I suppose, what you'll say. But the answer, I think, is no. You can't pay enough attention to invasive species. What about landscape impacts? Consider the landscape impacts of predation. In North America, <clears throat> one of the habits people have is shooting varmints or poisoning them. So their basic, the most effective predators in North America, including the wolf and large bears and cougars and coyotes have been eliminated or seriously reduced in their ecological effectiveness over large areas. Uh, so there's hardly any wolves in the 48 states except around Yellowstone and in, in, in the northern Midwest. Uh, as a result, ecosystems are suffering from the absence of predation on deer and elk in many places, particularly national parks. It's kind of a conundrum. The, why in national parks do we see the effects of overbrowsing by deer and elk, but not so much outside of national parks? It's because there's a lot of bozos running around with guns outside the national parks shooting deer and elk. But, the frequency of hunting or the, the, and the percentage of people that hunt in North America is decreasing relatively rapidly. So it won't be long before there's not enough predation by human beings on deer and elk, and we're gonna to start to see the same phenomena we've seen in Yellowstone and in the Rocky Mountain National Park uh, occur everywhere in North America. And one of those phenomena is the disappearance of wetlands because of predation, uh, because of the disappearance of beavers. Why do beavers disappear when, when the, when the uh, wolves are gone? It's because they don't have anything to eat because the deer and elk are eating all the willows. So uh, there's always unintended consequences of messing around with Mother Nature. And that's a, the case in Yellowstone is a beautiful example of how all of these cascading effects occur once you eliminate the top predator from the system. In Australia, uh, the top predator is now the dingo because the thylacine and, and the devil were eliminated from the mainland <clears throat> several hundred years ago. <clears throat> and the dingo is all that's left. It was introduced 4,000 year, 4, years ago. Um, but it's become quite effective, particularly 
at controlling foxes and cats. And uh, we just had a paper in, um, in Austral Ecology, the Journal of the Ecological Society of Australia, uh, summarizing all the benefits that dingoes have. It's like arguing in Montana or Wyoming that wolves are good. Well, arguing that dingoes are good for nature in Australia uh, results in a little calumny too, but uh, uh, it's catching on. And a lot of land managers are really tired of constantly spraying or, or dropping poison baits all over Australia because they realize it's futile, it's doing more harm than good to the ecosystems. So there's more and more realization that the best thing we can do for Australia is allow the dingo to return to wherever there's no sheep grazing. It's impossible politically to do it where there's sheep grazing, of course. In Hawaii, the situation is the opposite. Uh, it's that there are too many predators for this ecosystem, too many cats, too many mongooses, too many rats. <clears throat> and they're doing a lot of harm to what remains of the flora and fauna of the islands. There are some landscape effects as well as the exotic species effects per se on, on, on individual species. I, I mentioned that uh, the wolf situation in North America, the same thing applies to the coyote where you eliminate the coyote in North America, what happens? Oh, well, in Texas, they did a big experiment about 20 years, 15 years ago, where there was one large area, they shot out all the coyotes, and there was a control area next to where they didn't. In both places, there were about 10 species of native rodents. Where they eliminated the coyotes, nine out of the 10 species disappeared. Why? Because uh, mesopredators took over when the coyotes didn't control them. Things like raccoons, for example, and uh, smaller predators, and uh, eliminated, no, I'm sorry, the wrong story. What happened was when the, they eliminated the coyotes was that one of the kangaroo rats, I've got my stories mixed up, one of the kangaroo rats became super abundant and outcompeted all the other rodents. So we went from 10 to 1 because it was the coyote that kept the, um, the kangaroo rat in check. So you never know. It's really impossible to predict what's going to happen when you remove a large predator from the system. In Australia, uh, if you re remove the dingo, the landscape changes because the foxes and cats are released. <clears throat> The, when you change in Australia the fire regime, which people have done since the aboriginal days, the, the aborigines tended to burn uh, late in the wet season and in small patches. So there was a mosaic of vegetation which protected the native species. That doesn't happen anymore. And, and, and fire effects started by European farmers is uh, are very serious. I'll, I'll come to Hawaii now. I don't have time to go through all of this. But one of the great things that's happening, or not great, but profound things that's happening, probably, but we don't know much about it in Hawaii, is the deficits of nutrients since uh, there's so many predators on the land that seabird colonies don't exist in large numbers on the main islands. Of course, there's been fire regime changes too. New kinds of herbivory, new kinds of predation, and new diseases, particularly in birds. And I hadn't even heard of the Ohia rust before. Sad to hear about that. So there's a fire. It happens to be an Australian fire. I'm sorry I don't have a picture of a Hawaiian fire. <clears throat> this is the point I was making a minute ago, that before humans, large numbers of seabirds nested on the islands, transporting nutrients from the ocean to the land. And those nutrient sources are virtually absent in modern times with a strong flux of nutrients and sediments back to the ocean. In, in, in the United States, uh, the Great Plains ecosystems have essentially disappeared, um, as have old growth forests, Mediterranean habitats, aquatic habitats, 
uh, coastal habitats and wetlands, they're all devastated in North America. In Australia, land clearing has been a problem and as has mining. Uh, right now in northern Australia, uh, because of the Chinese market for aluminum, uh, the, uh, much of the land is being mined for bauxite, which completely destroys the vegetation and it doesn't recover. Some, I mean, there's some, they, they, they restore vegetation, but it's not native vegetation. So there are very serious uh, losses to uh, in habitats in both of these continents. In the Hawaiian Islands, it's, it's much worse than that. 95% or so of the cover uh, and the species below about six or 700 meters is non-native, is naturalized species. So there's basically nothing natural that the average tourist to Hawaii sees. Uh, as far as fragmentation goes, um, Fragmentation is probably the most serious problem in North America, more serious now than habitat loss per se. In Australia, uh, and one of the reasons for that is that there's so many people. There's uh, what, over 300 million people in the United States. There's 21 million people in Australia in about the same area. In um, in, in the Hawaiian Islands, as I mentioned, the habitat fragmentation below about 600 meters doesn't matter because there's no natural habitat left to fragment. Above 600 meters, it's relevant, <clears throat> but there, the terrain is so rough and the human occupation and number of roads is so low that it's probably not much of a problem there either. Probably the most serious uh, challenge and, up and threat to uh, regarding fragmentation in the Hawaiian Islands is coastal development, which will, could fragment the, the coast, but also the waters off the coast due to pollution, due to jetties, and, and other abutments that change the, uh, the, the onshore current flows and, and change the deposition of sand, which will affect the economy of Waikiki. Uh, just as, this is just a slide that you've seen before that shows the world at night, and, but it gives a, a, good, a good visual of the density of people and the problem with fragmentation, say, in the United States and southern Canada, where you know, there's every part of the continent almost except for the Great Basin is glowing at night, and that's a, a good metaphor uh, surrogate for road density. And roads, as William O. Douglas said, are daggers into the heart of the wild. So wherever there's roads, and there's roads everywhere in North America, uh, there's not much wild left for, because of all the edge effects of roads. In Australia, just to go back to Australia, they're now, these for, the forest on the right is a eucalyptus regnans, regnans forest, a mountain ash forest. Mountain ashes are unbelievable trees. If you've never been to Tasmania, I strongly recommend that before it's too late, you go and see these trees, which are as big as, as sequoias, as big around at the base and as tall as sequoias. And they're just mowing them down, sometimes not even bothering to chip them and send the chips to China. Sometimes they're just burning them in order to plant uh, blue gums, like the ones on the uh, left of this photo, or Monterey pine, which they, which they call radiata pine, in rows, of course, because those are faster growing trees and they can make more money from those trees than they can by the natives. So it's really a disaster. And, and of course, none of the native fauna, a lot of animals depend on these native rainforests. These are rainforests. Um, uh, they, they don't do very well. And they also poison these uh, plantations all the time uh, to keep the mammal herbivory down and to keep insects out. Another major obstacle or cause of fragmentation in Australia is something we don't have in North America and you don't have in Hawaii, I think, are rabbit-proof fences that go thousands of kilometers and dingo fences in other parts 
of Australia, in the east and the west, that keep dingoes out of sheep herding areas. And uh, every once in a while there's a drought, and what do Australian fauna do in the drought? They try to move long distances. And this is a, a minor catastrophe. Sometimes thousands of emus and kangaroos die against the fences. Sometimes the military is sent out to shoot them and kill them all because they might knock down the fences, which are keeping rabbits and dingoes out of areas where there's pastoralism and farming. Let me talk for a minute about social and political obstacles to conservation in these three different kinds of places, a large continent in North America, Australia, and Hawaii. I'll just briefly mention that these days, in North America, government is considered an obstacle to conservation for reasons you're well aware of. I say these days, this hasn't always been the case, but even when, uh, and I can't remember when this was true, but when there's a pro-nature administration in Washington, uh, Clinton was not pro-nature very much, really. Uh, even when that happens, Nixon was the last pro-nature president, believe it or not. Uh, even when that happens, there's always a kind of a barrier, and uh, conservation NGOs don't automatically think of, well, let's partner with the government, with the state or the federal government. But in Australia, that's the first thing that conservationists think of. You don't do conservation in Australia without government. Even when it's a conservative government, like um, Victoria, to some extent, Tasmania is even worse, uh, you still work with state government and you still work with the Commonwealth go government, the federal government. Uh, the problem, I think, in Hawaii is similar to that in North America, but uh, maybe it's more like Australia in some ways. Actually, there's, more, there's more communication. This is a small town. Hawaii is a small town, basically. And so there's more communication with government, but I sense that the governments here get tangled up in their own red tape and that there's not a sense of urgency to do what needs to be done, to implement management plans, for example. No oomph, There's not enough oomph, passion. In Hawaii, I, I hit upon one, uh, one issue uh, that that is definitely ideological that I think is hampering conservation in Hawaii. And that's what I call the Nietzschean fallacy. Nietzsche uh, believed in the super race idea, in racial purity, and he hated Jews. And if he were around now, he'd hate all the other minorities, I'm sure, too, because they might pollute the master race. And this attitude of racial purity, which Certainly, you don't embrace in Hawaii, obviously. Uh, and that's one of the great things about Hawaii, is that it's such a melting pot genetically as well as culturally. Uh, but for some reason, biologists still harbor this view about the role of racial purity and the overwhelming fear of mixing things up that should be kept apart, even when there's plenty of evidence that with regard to uh, new invasions of exotics, in, the, in North America and in Australia, they, everyone recognizes the need to address very aggressively new invasions, to spot them, to find them before, while they're still in the log growth phase, before they take off and before they become impossible to eradicate. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, but we never learn that. I mean, we know it intellectually, but uh, because of the way budgets in, in government agencies are allocated, there's never enough money for prevention. Same with medicine. So uh, I think in, in, in the case of Hawaii, maybe there's insufficient government leadership in this regard to, to aggressively attack new invasives and to do what we can with the old ones. Uh, if we ask what have been the debacles in management in these various continents, certainly in North America it's been uh, 
the failure to, ha to halt habitat loss and the proliferation of roads. We're afraid to halt the proliferation of roads because the all-terrain vehicle lobby might get mad at us. In Australia, uh, there's, until recently, uh, land clearing has been part of the culture, just chaining whole regions of country for, uh, so that people can graze sheep on it. And the other major problem is coastal development, uh, allowing coastal development to, to occur unimpeded by, uh, by legislation and rules that prevent it. I think in the Hawaiian Islands, the major debacle has, from what I've been told by several people, is that there have been uh, guidelines and management recommendations and management plans for protected areas in Hawaii for decades in some cases, and in those, which sit on the shelf gathering dust, or the recommendation, fence it. Fence it to keep out the feral ungulates, at least the feral ungulates. And uh, apparently, uh, it's, it just is agonizingly slow. This just doesn't happen very fast. It seems to me that's one of the most important things in Hawaii you can do, and I'll explain this in a minute, a little more clearly maybe. Finally, or getting close to the end, what's the relevance <clears throat> of uh, continental reserve design principles. You know, the conservation biologists in North America came up with all of these simple uh, rules about how to design a, a network of protected areas or how to design a protected area. And these rules, as you can see, are uh, starting from the top. It's better to have a, a round shape which reduces the perimeter area of a reserve than a very elongated reserve because of all the edge effects. The whole, if it's very elongated like that, everything will be affected by the edge effects. Similarly, fragmentation is worse than non-fragmentation in the second one. In the third one, having reserves close together so things can move between the reserves more easily uh, is better than having them far apart. Bigger is better than small, the next one. Uh, connected is better than unconnected. Having native predators is better than losing the native predators. And uh, one large reserve is probably better than several small reserves, on average. How do these apply in a place like Hawaii? And certainly in North America, Australia, and Hawaii, they, the first one applies. That shape is important. Edge effects are important. So everybody agrees on that one. Down at the bottom now, <clears throat> uh, in, 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 in the Hawaiian Islands, having a lot of small reserves is probably better than having one large reserve. And Dan Simberloff would just be very happy to hear me say that, if you know that old argument. But the opposite is true here. You can't have large reserves in Hawaii. One reason is that it's not large enough to have a Yellowstone Park. <clears throat> Secondly is you can't manage a large reserve. If you have to manage pigs and goats and rats and mongooses and, and all the exotic vegetation, it becomes impossible in a large reserve. And you don't need large reserves because you don't have a megafauna. You don't have wolves and mountain lions running around that have to have a large area in order to have an, a large, effective, genetically effective population size to prevent inbreeding or to prevent demographic crises. So I'd say a lot of small reserves, much more than you have now, probably 10 times as many, is what is needed, not large reserves, which are impossible to manage. It's just a question of pragmatics. It's practical. It's impractical to have large reserves. With regard to large versus small, the same thing applies. Small reserves are probably better because they would be a lot easier to manage against all of the problems. What about fragmentation? Yeah, fragmentation is a problem, particularly internal fragmentation. What about predators? No, not in Hawaii. The only predators are exotic, so you need to get rid of them. So we don't want to maintain predators. What about connectivity? Well, uh, do you need connectivity between lots of small reserves in the Hawaiian Islands? I don't think so, 
because the animals that need connectivity can fly, the, the insects and the birds. The other things, the plants really don't need much connectivity. So the issue is, is, is that on the mainland, you need connectivity on the ground. On the islands, things have to be close enough together so they're stepping stone reserves, so they can fly or move in the air from one to another. So the, the idea of having actual corridors on the ground between small reserves uh, in the Hawaiian Islands just doesn't make any sense. So that one doesn't make any sense. And with regard to the spacing of small reserves, um, again, the animals and critters that are going to move between reserves, uh, maybe they need a little quarantine. So, uh, and they can fly. So again, I don't think that the spacing is so important in the Hawaiian Islands. So four out of, five out of the seven of these principles, these hallowed principles of res reserve design on the continents just doesn't apply in the Hawaiian Islands. That's, that's what I was driving at when I said, you know, forget everything you learned on the mainland. <clears throat> so what do we learn from the past? Bottom-up regulation dominated the Hawaiian Islands prior to settlement, and the effects still reverberate. We still need to think of the Hawaiian Islands as bottom-up driven, uh, nutrient-driven, and primary productivity-driven. And part one of the, so the, ab, and the, the absence of herbivores means that the flora and fauna of Hawaii are, uh, and carnivores are extremely vulnerable to invasion. What about the present? Exotic predators continue to degrade the biota. Habitat fragmentation and reserve size are minor issues on the islands, except in the coastal zone, perhaps. Most mainland design principles do not apply on oceanic islands. Mainland training and biases might hamper conservation programs on the islands. What about the future? Management issues will be more important than traditional design principles in the islands. Bureaucratic inertia and red tape will continue to be major obstacles to effective conservation on the islands. Fencing, time is of the essence. Appeals for more research, and here I know some of you will get really pissed at me, but scientists are always saying, we need to do more research, and because that's the way they were trained. And they're, they're, scientists are drones. They, they believe everything they learned in graduate school. But in many cases, we don't need to do more research. We need to put fences up. I knew I'd get applause from some of you. The, re the rest of you, I'm watching for tomatoes flying. Uh, just a couple more remarks. Uh, I, in the previous talk in Australia, I asked some provocative questions and made some statements. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going to do that, but it takes more room than I had in this slide. So, on to the next slide. Say, uh, at this meeting, at the end of this meeting every year, when you have this meeting every year, you all got together at the end of the meeting and you left your titles and your affiliations and your institutions outside in the lobby. In other words, you, you came in to, a, to the last meeting without your institutional identities. And you put your entire budget on the table up here. You just put your budget here, all the money, which amounts to $65, $70 million in the Hawaiian Islands for conservation every year. And then you all got together and said, okay, for this coming year, what's the best way to spend this $70 million that's up here on the podium? In other words, you start from scratch. What, what would we do next year to save creation if we left behind our institutional commitments and, and identities? Okay, that said, <clears throat> let me go on to the final, or almost the final slide. Some proposals. Use surrogate species to replace missing ecological functions. If the Hawaiian species are gone forever, consider surrogate species to replace those functions. 
Promote gene flow, as I've already said, between small remnant populations within and between islands to overcome low effective population sizes and genetic bottlenecks of less than, say, about 20 individuals. Legislate neutering of all cats. <laughs> Rewild offshore islets with native biota. I mean, you don't have to as Dave said, reinvent the wheel. This technology exists. The, the New Zealanders have been doing this for decades now, and they know how to do it. You don't have to reinvent it here. Apply extensive inter situ restoration on larger islands after purchase or conservation easements on the land. This is something you'll hear a lot more about um, from, from Bernie and Lida and their colleagues uh, later in this meeting. And immediately fence all small reserves. That <laughs> sounds like a broken record, I know. So I want to thank uh, the people who contributed greatly to this talk for their suggestions and generous assistance. And remind you, that's all. Thank you. <laughs>